Hello, everyone. Welcome to AGO from Home and our Art in the Spotlight with Jeff Burke. I'm Annie Roper, and I'm the Curatorial Assistant of Talks and Partnerships here at the AGO. Before we get started, I'd just like to start by acknowledging that the land that the AGO is on is Michisagi Nishinawabe Territory, Mississauga. It is also governed by a treaty between the Mississauga of the Credit and the Canadian government. Toronto is Michitsagi Anishinaabe territory. It has also been occupied by other Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Wendat confederacies. So today we've got Jeff Burke and Jeff Burke is a self-taught multidisciplinary artist working with photography, sculpture, video, and paint. Born to the late artists Liz and David Burke, he grew up in Peterborough and learned the basics of photography and composition from his father. His work has been exhibited nationally, engaging themes that grapple with grief, addiction, homelessness, and settler colonial constructs of beauty and masculinity. Predominantly known for his portraiture, Burke makes work that poses serious questions about the ethics of street photography. Through a practice of collaborative photography, Burke and his collaborators disrupt the formal definition and economics of photojournalism and problematize the idea of the photographer as the sole author of the photograph. Indu Vashist is a, served as the executive director of SABAC, the South Asian Visual Arts Center since 2013. She's interested in art that is not precious and words that are not precise. So thank you for joining us today, our audience. Just a quick note today about how this talk will unfold. Jeff and Indu will be in conversation and we'll have time to take audience questions. Please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to ask your question. Um, this talk is being recorded and will be available on the AGO's YouTube channel in the coming weeks. And finally, uh, thank you to the TD Ready Commitment, our lead sponsor of talks and performances for generously supporting this talk. So I'm going to disappear and leave it to you two. Thank you, Annie. You're welcome. Thanks. Thanks so much, Annie. Uh, hi, Jeff. Hi. Hi. Um, so I thought we could just begin with you maybe telling us a bit about what your life looks like today, like, or in this period of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, my, uh, I think like the best way to describe it is I feel kind of like I'm balancing on something juggling you know, and then there's just like more balls being thrown into the juggling. Um, and yeah, I think like everybody, um, you know, my life has changed so much in, during the past year and, and during the pandemic. Um, you know, like a year and a half ago, I was feeling like a lot of great momentum. I was um, kind of like writing out a Canada Council grant. Um, I had this like studio on DuPont where me and my friends were hanging out and I was able to open it up to other artists. And I was just starting to feel like more possibility in terms of like what an artistic practice could look like. Um, I was working retail at a camera shop and, you know, juggling like making money and surviving in Toronto and, you know, finding time to like connect with artists and to make art and do stuff like that. Um, but it definitely felt like there was a lot of momentum. Um, I had a show at the Loon and 2020 was supposed to be like this really great year you know I had was part was supposed to be part of a group show at the AGO and this big show in Museum London and a show at MoCA um, and so I was feeling really excited and like everyone else um, a lot of things were really just removed when when we entered the pandemic um, and at first like I kind of welcomed that that solitude and that time to just kind of like really reflect on the ways that I had been living and like what things were working and what things were not working. Um, but yeah, definitely my life changed and, um, you know, I lost my job. Um, all those shows kind of disappeared. So a lot of the things that felt stable and felt like I had worked a long time to get to a specific place kind of just disappeared and, 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 you know, I was left just kind of wondering how I was going to survive and, and keep all these things going. Um, early on, I guess last, I think it was like April or May, um, a group of us responded to a call underneath the Gardner Expressway where they were clearing an encampment. And the week leading up to that was kind of like the first time I had left my house uh, since March. And I was really struck by the size of the encampments that I saw, the amount of tents, you know, and I was like thinking about 
the things that I had been struggling with and then imagining like, you know, what that would look like for someone that was living on the street that was suddenly cut off from like the things that were so important to their survival. Um, and so anyway, a group of us uh, responded to this support underneath the Gardner Expressway. And for me, it was like a pretty transformative day. Um, and what I noticed was like the very clear, like the clear violence uh, that the city was enacting on residents, the coercive and confusing process that unfolded before us was was wild. You know, like there was just bulldozers swept in and, you know, police and all these like city officials um, stating claim and kind of like, you know, acting like they were um, giving people options, but effectively just saying like, you have to leave or this bulldozer is going to destroy your belongings. And, and so, um, there was a few of us there that were artists and um, Simone Schmidt was there who was someone that has some experience organizing and there was a lot of frontline workers that showed up to that response. Um, so Zoe Dodd was one of those people. And so I, we just kind of noticed like in that moment that these people that had been working tirelessly throughout the pandemic doing frontline work were also being called to support um, encampment residents during this clearing. And so kind of like slowly and organically, um, a small group of us formed the encampment support network. And initially what that looked like was it was just a rapid response group um, to show up when the city was going to clear encampments. And we quickly kind of realized that um, there was a greater need and that there were a lot of gaps that the city wasn't supporting folks. And we kind of like rapidly organized um, in an ad hoc way to try to figure out like how to get basic things to people on a regular basis. Um, and so we formed this group and kind of like organized it in different neighborhood committees um, so that volunteers would get donations and do outreach daily in different parks, providing basic things like socks and water and ice, Gatorade, tents and sleeping bags. And these are just like basic things that people needed to survive, you know? Um, and one of the first kind of like meetings while ESN was forming happened in Moss Park. Um, and so I guess we can bring up some photographs now. Um, but a lot of the work that I've been doing the past year and in terms of like what my daily lo life looks like is spending time in Moss Park. Um, and so this image is this uh, poster, We Are Not the Virus. So early on we connected with um, some people at Parkdale Queen West and we talked to residents there about what kind of messages they would want on signs. So in the early days of ESN, we just like, you know, hand painted these signs and um, went to the encampments and, and, you know, asked people if they wanted signs. And we're just trying to like get a sense of like what people actually needed and what kind of role we could fill. And so the, the yeah, I, I just remember vividly those early days in Moss Park. And um, I feel so grateful for people that kind of like have taught me like people like Les Harper and Zoe Dodd um one of the first days in Moss Park when, when this image was made um my friend John Bush and Simone met with Zoe Dodd and Amanda Leo from Tops, and they kind of like brought us around and we got to start meeting people and ESN wasn't really fully formed at this time it was more just like conceptual yeah, Tops being the overdose prevention society yeah yeah, yeah. so the Tops uh, were people that had organized in the park previously and um, kind of like let us know the history of organizing in that place um, and how that would affect the work. So this is an image of uh, my, my beautiful, beautiful friends, uh, Derek and Michelle. And this, this interaction and this photograph are like very important um, because I, I'm, I'm just someone that's been drawn to Moss Park since I first came to Toronto. You know, like it was a place where like I, I, I always worked near that intersection. Um, I was using drugs in that place and just had some very intense moments. And so this day when we met Derek and Michelle and put up the sign, you know, I asked them if I could take this photograph and if we could share it. And in that conversation, we, we realized that we had um, a mutual friend. So one of my old dear friends who passed away, Carl Lance Benici, um, was really had been really close to Michelle so this is like this first day we met and I remember like showing Derek and Michelle on my phone like the the art that Carl and I had made you know like these beautiful photographs and telling those stories and you know showing this like sculpture of 
of Carl. And so it's just like a really beautiful moment to recognize that, um, you know, we knew the same people and we had this different, but like we all, we had both had this connection to this place. Um, and so, yeah, I guess for the last year, um, most of my life has looked like uh, working with ESN and spending a lot of time in the park to do outreach in the park and to connect with residents and to try to um, really monitor the city. And we've been able to do some pretty incredible things, but it's really ultimately changed my life in terms of like action and work and what that looks like. Um, so a lot of my days are spent in relationship to that place and to the, the people that I've met very intensely over the past year. Um, yeah, I think I work for Anishinaabe Health now. And so I'm also doing, um, working with the vaccine rollout to indigenous communities and doing COVID contact tracing. Um, so most days are just like out of control. Like I don't even know what a day off is really anymore. We were talking early in, earlier into and I had like cleared today on my schedule to try to prepare for this talk. And it just kind of like from the time I woke up like snowballed um, out of hand just because there's just a lot of stuff going on and a lot of people with some needs. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think that I feel so grateful um, to be doing this work. I feel grateful for the people that I've been able to meet that have taught me and that have taken me under their wing. I feel great, grateful for people like Derek Black, um, who is someone that like fought the city, you know, like single-handedly stood against, um, you know, the police destroying his things, stood against city officials serving him with illegal eviction notices, and really just stood his ground and said that like, you know, like I'm not leaving this park until I get permanent housing. And Derek's like my close friend. We, he checks in on me almost every day and just calls, make sure I'm doing good, you know? Um, so it's funny how those relationships work and it's, it's just been really beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, thanks for sharing that. Um, I wanted to talk about some of your earlier work um, before we move into like the meat of the conversation. And I thought the most obvious place to start uh, with some of your earlier work is um, the humor. Your earlier work has a lot of staging. It's really, it's pretty campy. And um, you can see that there's, you know, there's a lot of momentum and action in a lot of your, in, in a lot of your photographs. And for me, I come from a theater background, so I can kind of understand the way in which blocking happens within your photographs. And so I was wondering if you could speak to the, how you make decisions with your collaborators around the composition of each photo? Well, I mean, if I'm honest, like I, I owe a lot of that to Jimmy. Um, like the, the kind of like the representation of that humor is like often like like me as someone with the camera, like he's he's the person posing. So often like- So, so for our viewers, Jimmy is one of Jeff's collaborator, collaborators, um, Jimmy James Evans. We will see images of him as we go along. But go ahead. Yeah, sorry. So Jimmy's like, yeah. So Jimmy's like my, 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 Jimmy's like the most beautiful person. And uh, he's like, to know him is like, to know someone that's, he like always just cracking jokes, you know? And that's like how we met. Um, and you know, he's like a panhandler. So it's like, there's, that's just part of how he is and who he is. And I think that, um, yeah, I think that like humor is such, such good medicine, you know? And I think that like um, the way that, we're always relating in the way that we feel comfortable with each other in relationship has so much to do with with humor and with uh you know just like cracking jokes and like Jimmy's just so good at like expressing that with his body um and so I think yeah like and and, and sometimes it's just the act of photographing itself is so absurd like to be asking someone to take their photograph like you know like my desire to to photograph Jimmy is met with his like like funny reaction you know like often he's in front of the camera you know just like cracking jokes at me you know just being like you're crazy you're crazy um but yeah it, it definitely i think that um humor is often like a sign of like a, a sign of resilience or it's like mm -hmm. connected in a way to like resilience and to survival 
Um, sorry, we're a bit behind in these images. These are still Moss Park. Yeah, uh, we're almost there. Yeah. Um, I just, I guess for me, um, the question that I have around the humor is also around the composition of each image because um, you work in such a collaborative way with all of the people that you that are in your frame. Um, I'm just wondering, like, how does how do those decisions get made together of what each photo is going to look like? I think, well, that's something that's evolved, you know, over over a long period of time, like almost the past ten years or so. And I think that the images that were make that we've been making lately, like that I've been making with my friends, with Jimmy and um, Carmela and Hakeem and my friends that I met in the back 40. Like, I think that um, those images used to be a lot more impulsive. Um, and so we were just like, you know, and, and like less intentional, like the staging and, and everything like that. So I think that like this image of Blue Nose, for instance, like, like at, for me, like on a personal level, like it definitely contains that that same kind of like um, relationship, and and, it, and and but the decision was like a much more impulsive decision, and I think through, um, like the the length and of the relationship that I have with my friends and the kind of like transparency in our process, then those those things have involved evolved. I mean, mm -hmm. um, like the staging. So definitely earlier on. Um, the photographs were less staged mm -hmm. um, and, and, and in the last year, like they've become much more intentional. Um, so there's the images we've been making that, that stick out in my mind, like it looks like, you know, a conversation and like definitely like my desire is always to be like around the sky and to be, you know, taking photographs and, uh, before they used to be, I guess, a bit more um, candid. And now, mm -hmm. now the decision making feels like a lot more collective because everyone really knows um, kind of like the possibility of, of making art and making images and like, you know, like what a photograph could look like on a large scale, um, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and like, how much of your relationship with, with your friends is about photography? So much of it. This is, this is actually an important image. This is Carl who died. And this, I think, answers this, the, the previous question a little bit is like, um, Carl had been sitting on the, the, these church steps and we had been talking about photography and it was, it was this like funny thing between us, um, those conversations. And I had, snapped a little photograph on my iPhone of him in this pose with this exact light. And we both looked at it and decided we wanted to like take it with a proper camera and, and make a big print out of it. And it was really funny trying to like replicate that like that like moment of time. Like, you know, I, I remember vividly like I'd be at work and, you know, we'd have a plan to meet at like, cause it was in the fall. So the light was at a certain angle and we just would have so many like failed plans to meet up at this like very crucial time to recreate the photograph and then when we did it felt like really special you know and it became like part of the story uh between us when we were like looking at this photograph and and talking about it so this this was a very early one yeah do you want to go back to your relationship and your friendships vis-a-vis -vis photography or like and vice versa. I guess it's like, you know, like how much of your friendships are about photography and with photography as like the way in which you work together. So I think, well, yeah, I think for I think to know me, like for anyone to know me is to know me as someone that's like very uh, obsessively photographing, you know, and so it's not, it's like my relationships that I have with people that I make art with are, are no different in that sense. Um, I'm, I, I'm, been sober for about nine and a half years now and so sometimes like for me like I don't get um I can't like connect through through substance in the way that I used to and so I think early on like my like I used like photography as a way to try to connect um and I think just with 
with like Blue Nose, for instance, or who's in this image right now, or with Jimmy, like for me, definitely the, the act of photographing, you know, it allows me uh, sometimes like a certain distance from things. Um, and also it allows me to connect in ways, right? Just in the sharing, mm -hmm. um, there's like this really like very simple, um, beautiful way that you know, like making an image and manipulating light and then like sharing that with, with, with someone can be like this like act of joy. And I definitely experience that all the time. Um, I don't know if that answers the question specifically. But... Yeah, we can go, we can get more into it. Um, so we've been speaking about your collaborative work so far and, you know, within your collaborative work. Um, so this is the work that features humans in which you work with humans and humans are in the frame. I find that work is really full of eros, so like life. And it's very like, you feel the aliveness within the frame. Mm -hmm. While your solo work, which um, you know has clouds and curtains, th those particular works that are, that are works that you're making by yourself, they feel like meditations um, or touching upon the more tender parts of grief and, like, and also otherworldly encounters. And it seems to me that you're buoyed and rooted to this realm through your relationships with the living. But then your, your work with the sky, it's about communing with those that are liberated from this realm. And I'm wondering if you could speak about the different aspects of your practice. How does your collaborative practice differ from your solo practice? I think that the, the collaborative parts of photography for me are definitely um, about trying to preserve something or to like hold on to something. So I think like the relationship of photographing a person for me is like equally as rooted in grief as images of clouds or curtains. Um, but with a person it, it serves, definitely for me serves like a more specific intention. You know, it becomes sometimes like a placeholder for memory, um, it allows me to, it, yeah, it feels like it's more like for me, like to photograph, you know, like I'm looking at these images, like to photograph like Carl or Jimmy or Blue Nose is to like, in that moment, be like, like honoring that moment and being able to like return to it, return to that experience with that person. Um, whereas like the, the curtain series or the images of clouds are more speak to like a longing for maybe not having that with other people, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that like, yeah, there's just something important about, for me about, you know, like these images of us and it kind of, they kind of like speak to me in this way, like this happened, like we were here, you know? And it's like often, um, yeah, there are ways for me just in a really simply simple way to like remember, you know, like Sammy in this photograph, Sammy died, you know, mm -hmm. and there's just been a lot of loss. And, and I think it's like good, just, not just for me, but for like all of us to be able to have these images to like hold on to like the importance that like people had in our lives, you know, um, mm -hmm. but definitely for me personally, it's like rooted to, to loss you know, and like this desire to like hold on to the living, you know, to like, to, to be like faced, faced with more, with mortality and be like, okay, like, I want to like be as active in love and relationship as possible. And I want to be able to return to those moments and remember them, you know, mm -hmm. um, whereas like the, the, the ways that I'm in relationship to the clouds or the ways that I'm in relationship to like painting, um, are, yeah, are, I guess are just more, more about like longing as mm -hmm. a grief, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm just so curious about your collaborative practice versus your solo practice, because I mean, the aesthetic is, is quite different, but also it seems like the intentions are different. And I'm wondering for you personally, whether they hold different places for you in your life. They do and they don't. I mean, to me, that I'm always like, I feel like I'm always trying to like fold one into the other. Mm. You know, like, so it's like, I guess like more or less now I'm always trying to photograph and for the last long, long while, like 
to photograph with the sky as the only backdrop, mm -hmm. you know, as a way of like con con uh, combining the two, you know, or like pairing the two. Um, but yeah, I think that definitely there's like, you know, if I'm looking at my relationship to art, um, I think that the, you know, I was like a drug user for so long mm -hmm. and, and drugs offered me like a way to survive, you know, and they offered me like a way to feel like really connected to community and connected in this way. And, and so when I stopped using drugs, like I was really like searching for something in, in, in the absence of that, that space. And when, and also my parents died when I was younger. And so with my, my parents loss, I was searching for something in their absence as well. And so I feel like the ways that I live and the ways that I'm in relationship to people that's expressed through art, that's expressed through photography, um, like is like me trying to like connect in that same way, you know, and just now I don't have that. Now I'm not able to connect through using with people, you know, and like to know me is to know someone that photographs. So it's like, if I'm around, if I'm in community, I'm going to be photographing eventually, maybe. Um, but it's definitely like to be in relationship and collaboration with other people is like intense. Like those exchanges can be like very intense and dynamic. Um, and I kind of love chaos and I'm attracted to that definitely. Um, but ultimately in order to balance out that intensity, there has, for me, there has to be like a place to like reflect and a place to be still, you know? So it's like, I think that the other part of the other work as, as we're dividing it is like the expression for me of that place, you know, mm -hmm. more like solitude and reflection. Well, that leads me to my next question. Are there certain mediums that you turn to when you seek solitude or are there certain mediums where you seek relationality? And then related to that, we spoke about this in our previous conversation, but we, you spoke about easy. <laughs> you were like, photography is easy. And I was like, so struck by that. And I, I thought about it all day. Like, why is it easy? And, yeah. or like, what, what's challenging about other mediums for you? Like, it, so I wanted to know, like, okay, first about the solitude and the relationality and whether there's specificity in terms of medium um, in which medium you choose. Mm -hmm. And then about the concept of easy versus challenging. Okay, well, it's a long story. Like everything I think is a long story and complicated. So I Go think, that, okay, so it's like, so it's like photography was not like the, like the same way. And I'm so lucky, I'm so, lucky for this right but like my dad when I was a kid gave me a camera and so I I, I at a young age um was was given a camera and it felt like if I like think back to it um photography at like this time in my life when I felt like I couldn't do anything was like the only thing that I felt good at doing you know and it felt like this like this early this this thing that was like connected to my early development as a person um and so and then there was this long period in life where, um, you know, like I was using drugs and my parents died and a lot of change happened. Um, and so to come, and, and so for me, photography was like a return. So like the act of taking photographs was this thing that seemed like the only thing that made sense to um, try to like express the things that I felt like I needed to express or wanted or desired to express. Um, and so I don't know why, but that, when I say like that's easy, it's just because I've been doing it for a long time. So that the it's it's just what I do. I think that um, you know I live with a lot of these. My my father was a, a painter and he made a lot of different work. But I live with a lot of these large painted photographs of his, and so we would make print these large landscapes and mount them on panel and kind of like paint into and around them. And so I think like a lot of times. I just like sat and like tried to connect with him through that work. Um, and really like that formed like this desire to try to make some of that work myself and to try to understand like the relationship between painting and photography. Um, and so in this way, I guess, um, the painted photographs have been a way to try to connect with him in, in terms of material. Um, I think that there's like, yeah. 
So when you're doing your painted photographs or we saw some cyanotypes earlier, like the, there is experimentation on your part. Like you are exploring a, like a variety of different medium or um, working in, in different ways with photo by, by painting on them. Is that also an attempt to like collaborate in, in another way? Like whether it's like drawing inspiration from your father or like, I'm just, I'm, I'm curious about Though, because I, I, you don't, your your work that you're known for is mostly um, but photography, but then you have done other things like the blankets, for instance. I think are like a, a really great story. They're also such a to work with textile in that way and that kind of textile. Like if you maybe you could speak to some of those other ways in which you explored working with photograph. Mm. Yeah, I mean so. Well, okay, so I think like, so as, so for me, I love like the physical print. Like I love, to me, there's something like so exciting about the the, the physical object. And to me, it's like really deeply connected to um, my relationship to memory and to like this idea of like layering. Um, and so early on, um, well, the first show that I had, the Back 40 show, I made these, a, a lot of, you know, large scale photographs and had them like really nicely framed and mounted. Um, and it was so, they looked so incredible, but at the end of it, I was left with these like very expensive objects that in this way, like didn't really serve a purpose, you know, like there was just these things that like, I felt particularly precious about and, you know, like I, because of how much they cost and I would be like moving them from apartment to apartment and stuff like that. Um, so there's like a lot of things at play, but definitely one thing in terms of like experimenting with different, like printing on different materials was just to try to get, try to make prints that were like easier to uh, give to people that were easier to like move around. Like if you think of like a blanket or like a piece of silk, like I could easily just scrunch that up, put it in a pocket, you know, and like hand it to someone. Um, I was, I am always def like interested in like the idea of like re-photographing things. Um, so for me, the fabric was like really interesting uh, because it spoke to me in all different ways. Um, but one of those, one of the cool things was that, you know, I was able to take an image that was like a place in time, you know, and like turn it into this object and then re-photograph that object. Um, so that was like, that, that was really exciting to me. Um, the blanket series was so fun. You know, I was definitely, I had, <laughs> I had wanted to do this for a long time and before I could afford to do it I saw Rebecca Belmore's blanket that she made and it and it fucking blew my mind and I was just like oh my gosh like this artist who I just adore like made this thing that's like better than anything I could make and so there was definitely a period where I was like oh I can't like I can't do this like this person's already done it incredibly like what is there more to say but anyway so but I, th I still thought it was funny but with the with me for me these images are like are just so cool and it did like it was a, a fun process for all of us like in these like in the small gesture of like you know showing up to my back the back of my apartment with a blanket with jimmy on it and just like that exchange between us in that moment to see that the image of him on a blanket there was like something so absurd about that and then in, in terms of like thinking about like beauty and, and stuff like that. Like they're just, they were just so beautiful to then re-photograph. Um, and they also served like a, a function, right? Like this was a time when I was seeing a lot of people sleeping on hot air grates. Uh, and so the blanket as like a motif or whatever was like very strong, you know? And like, to me, it like connected to, you know, the folds and the, the, the fabric folds and like an old master's painting, you know? And then that to me was like a way deeply connected to like my relationship with my father you know and the hospital curtain series like the fabric played a big role in in that series because I was you know in this place of like intense grief and using um the act of photographing as a way to escape and then reflecting on the beauty of the curtains as a way to try to make sense of like the complicated relationship I had to grief right so for me the the taking a photograph and then putting it on fabric just seemed like a natural extension of those ways of thinking, you know? Um, and then also in a practical way, it just was like more accessible to everybody as the cyanotypes were, 
you know, like um, the cyanotapes were like cost next to nothing to make. I could develop them in my kitchen sink with my friends around. They could, we could collectively experience the joy of seeing an image develop, right? Which is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, and then, and then they're just these like they're like they're precious spiritually. You know what I mean? Like they they have like a preciousness because of what they are, but like they're not precious in terms of how much it costs, right? Mm -hmm. Which is like, really important, right? Mm -hmm. Because like I can't afford to spend you know a thousand dollars to frame a photograph to make it look nice mm -hmm. you know it's just not it's just not a thing um so yeah and then the paint the, the the and if you look at these like i'm always interested in the process right so it's like really and again about like the the repetition and layering right like it's really i love like i love like photography because i'm able to like like make something out of the pro the process itself becomes something, you know. Um, yeah. There's a question from the audience that I think is a is a nice um, segue. Okay. Um, they say, can you talk about the context of reception and the different audiences that you have in mind in your collaborative work? A photograph does different work, has different impact. Um, and is a part of a different conference, uh, conversation when it's shown in Moss Park or if it's shown at the AGO. How do you make decisions with your friends about where and how these images are presented? Um, well, yeah, so I think, so if I'm circling back to talk about, about um, ideas around consent and transparency, like I feel like for the past however long while like most of my practice the conversation has been around the ethics of photography um and definitely i've been trying to like disrupt those formal relationships um like the photographer and the person that's being photographed um and i guess that that i'll just we should talk about it but that came about because um i had been photographing people sleeping on the streets and I was making those photographs without consent. I was walking up to people sleeping, taking the image, posting it on Tumblr. Um, and I think I was driven by a lot of things, but I had this like idea that, you know, if enough people saw these images of like what was happening, then something would change. And I don't think that, I, I actually just don't believe in that anymore. Um, I was offered to publish that work and there was a lot of people in my life that were close to me and people that were not close to me that were really critical of the exploitative nature of that, of those images specifically. Um, and I remember feeling really defensive about it at the time. Um, but ultimately I decided not to publish that work and really just stopped making photographs. I just stopped and I just really had to think about like um, my own privilege always and what responsibility I had to that, I had to my own, to my privilege in the act of photographing in the way that I was and what I wanted. And I think that, so from then on, I've been, I've been developing a, a collaborative practice that's transparent. And that means like ongoing consent with the people that I'm photographing in terms of like where the images are shown. Um, and honestly, it's just, that's, it's just so, e it's just so easy. It just feels so easy now, you know? And, um, and so, yeah, like, so if I, so to answer the question, like any image of anyone in Moss Park is shown every time I show it, or, you know, like if it's in like a magazine or a newspaper or this talk, like the, com the conversations happen with those specific people, like, Hey, is this okay? Like I'm, and, and it's not like, I don't speak to people in my friends in Moss Park or like any other people I collaborate with any different than I would speak to anyone else. So it just looks like, hey, the AGO wants to do this talk. Like, can I show this image? And that's, so that's, those are the conversations that happen. Um, in a practical way, like I share, we split, everyone splits profits. We split all money. Um, and that's to say that, you know, like in this image, like Brian and, and the, Sean and everyone in this painting, like their lived experience is just as important to this painting as like my role as the person making the print and painting into it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so we would split, 
we just split all the money um, mm -hmm. and everyone just gets asked where their image, where like people get, we just have the conversations all, all, all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I, the question was also about like the, like intention around representation or yeah. so around like presentation, particularly like, so when you're showing images in Moss Park versus showing images like at a gallery, for instance, like, do you have different considerations of what you think is appropriate to show to different audiences? Or do you, like, how do you make those decisions around what you decide to show where? Uh, yeah, I don't know about appropriate. I don't know. I think that I think that I believe in people being able to make decisions for themselves about mm -hmm. that stuff. So it's like I can't I can't like speak to like what someone else feels is appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the only way to know is to ask. Mm -hmm. um, but I definitely don't have any like I don't I'm not operating with like any any like like I'm not operating with any belief that like someone's going to walk into a gallery and see an image and it's going to like disrupt the, the city's violence or something like that like i do feel like that images mm -hmm. have a, i feel like images are sometimes like potent in the sense that they can like um speak truth to something um but i think that for me it's really important that that comes with um a lot of a lot of trust like i think that the biggest problem i have with photojournalism is is how extractive it is that mm -hmm. we'll just come in and like you know take an image and exit a situation mm -hmm. and Derek, Derek always says this line I'm gonna butcher it he says he says fault uh something like false promise makes fools glad like the idea like don't promise something like just show up with it you know so it's like um yeah back to representation sorry I'm, I'm a rambler um well, more about more than representation, I think it's about presentation um, mm -hmm. and and venues and how you how you make decisions around like what to show at different venues. Or, I mean, it sounds like your concern, if I'm to understand it, is more about the representation rather than the presentation. Like, it's yeah. about making making sure that the people who are in the photographs feel comfortable with the way that they're being shown in the places that they will be shown. Yeah, and that happens like immediately. Yeah. Right? So it's like that's the beauty of di of digital photography, right? Is like I can take an image and like right away show someone, right? And delete images that don't make sense. And I think that like most of the time that all the time that decision making process is happening collectively and that the the I mean it's like weird cuz it's usually pretty clear which images are like are like stunning. Right. So like when Jimmy and I made this image that's on the screen that was shown at the loon, like, like, fuck, when we took that image, we both looked, we're looking at the camera, like freaking out, like excited, you know, mm -hmm. so like, to me, like, that's a good test that, that things are okay in terms of like, if I decide I want to make a print and then return to Jimmy and say, hey, can we show this for the show, you know? Um, so I think it, I think like with, I don't know, it's complicated. Well, what, so I feel like there's a well there's a real difference I think in terms of the images in this way and the images that I've been making in Moss Park um and the images I've been making for Jimmy with Jimmy and people because like I'm not showing images of Moss Park in the gallery and I don't think I ever would right um and so a lot of the requests I get for those images are from like news people or people that want to like tell that kind of story and so that the, the, it's just like the process just looks like having conversations with people that are in the photograph. Mm -hmm. um, and some of those conversations are newer and some of them have been going on for a very long time, yes. you know, like, and obviously like in this moment, like you've only gotten to know Derek over the course of the year, whereas you've known Jimmy for, well, there's lore around how long you've known yeah. Jim, Jimmy for, but um, so, those conversations may change over time of how and when you want to show images, but it is your process to build trust through repetition and consistency. Yeah. 
definitely. And, and there's, there's off there's like all the time people say no for a range of reasons. And that's mm-hmm. great. like, that's really good, you know? And, um, I think like, I think like if I'm thinking about, um, anyways, yeah, it's, it's complicated. I mean, the, 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 a lot of people that like a lot of, you know, people that use drugs and people that are living on the street are so brutalized often by the stigma and the assumptions that people make. Um, like, I just see that being like so connected to the way like the city acts and the way that like the media will report on what's happening and stuff like that. So I think that it's like, it's just important. Like, but I don't know, I say this all the time, but like, I would never photograph like, uh, you know, like my grandmother or, you know, like a lover, or like a, a, fr- a friend, like I would never photograph them in an embarrassing way and then like show that publicly, like to, to think about representation, you know, I think like often um, people like don't act that way with, if, if for in photojournalism and in, in documentary photography, like there's just not those same considerations. Um, so for me, those considerations are like foundational. And I, I'll just say also like the work um, in Moss Park, like I never went to that place to photograph, you know? And I think that's really important to say like um, the relationships that I have with people and that were developed um, happened through showing up consistently. And, you know, the first photograph I took was of this, of my friend Shaggy and I, you know, after a month and a half, I was, I asked him if I could photograph his portrait inside his tent because it looked really beautiful. And a couple days later, uh, he let, he let me and, um, and he, he, we, he was so happy. And then like this intense day, like a week later when the city was moving everyone to hotels. And I remember Zoe was there like fighting with like the cops and like a city worker about someone that wanted to keep a tent and like Shaggy's like hounding me to take this picture of him. You know, and so like this moment happened where we all sat and like Shaggy uh, choreographed like how we were posed and I handed my camera to someone to flash to another person and this image was made and then like five people saw the photograph and they freaked out and like everyone wanted me to photograph them. So a lot of the Moss Park images are like um, happened through that kind of like that romantic kind of like act of like people be of that joy of, of the the joy of that exchange, you know? And then in terms of representation, like when people, because of, you know, the the access to platform and privilege that I have, then the the responsibility for me has always been to like continue to get consent for people's images to be used in different contexts. And those Mm -hmm. conversations have relatively been pretty easy. Mm -hmm. We'll move on to our last question. Within the art world, there's a lot of suspicion on whether true relationality can exist between people who are different from each other. And that's with good reason. There's a hyper awareness and a criticality about the potential for exploitation between people of different classes, genders, races. And I'll admit that when you asked me to do this talk with you, my knee jerk defense was like, well, what can a white dude from an art family and I possibly speak to each other about? And that's an impulse that's based on my own lived experience of having my intellectual labor and emotional resilience being extracted by people of your identity. Of course, simultaneously, I've been following your work for several years and have seen you make mistakes. And you've alluded to those mistakes in today's talk. You own those mistakes and you attempt to correct them through process. Um, I've also witnessed you relate to the residents in the encampments with compassion and grace. And like you can see that coming through and all these photos and that's why I'm here with you today and I'm just wondering if you could speak to the idea of doing and undoing that you have to do within your both your practice in terms of like your artistic practice but also your process like what does it mean to be able to hold your space with your privilege and like experiment with that mm-hmm. it's I think it's yeah I mean it's like on it's it's ongoing for me like it's like never it's never not it's never not happening and it, it it's it feels like we were talking the other day like it feels like a constant shedding or trying to like shed um things I think that for me like the first thing that was like so important was um 
you know, like being, being someone that had experienced like violence as a child, you know, and, um, you know, my, and, and the death of my parents and the stuff that happened while I was using drugs and, you know, being someone that was like coming out of like, you know, another, another close person in my life dying in jail and all these things where I felt like really wronged, you know, in this way, like I felt like really, you know, fucked over and, um, and hurt and was experiencing a lot. And I think it was like important for me to recognize that like, even though I had experienced all those things that like, I was still granted this like undue power in the world, even, even though all that stuff had happened, you know, and like, that's what, what privilege is like, that's what, like, even though that stuff happened, like I benefit from white supremacy. I benefit from colonialism. I benefit from patriarchy. I benefit from all those things just because of who I am. And so that was like the, the first kind of important lesson of, of being like, okay, well then like, how am I, how does, what does like undoing look like um, as a person with, you know, desires and, and curiosity and stuff like that. And I don't know, it's just like, it's, it's just been like a lot of like, learning and then trying to practice you know and like we were talking the other day like a lot of like mistakes and failure along the way um you know i remember reading i remember reading um this leanne simpson book and i remember her describing if if her ancestors would recognize the land where and she was describing uh you know like peterborough this place that i, that I grew up in and for me, that was like this great reckoning with like my my understanding of like where I came from, you know what I mean? And like my entitlement to the history of a place and just to have that be like that those truths that I grew up with being like untrue, not true, you know, like not the real history of the land um, was a really powerful learning experience. Um, I think that in, in a lot of that, like undoing and shedding, like I felt, um, you know, pushed as a man to like, look at masculinity. And like, for me, what that looks like is a lot of emotional work with other men, you know, and, and that's like a huge part of my life. That's, I guess it's like, in some layer of every image I make or in some layer of every painting, but it's not explicit. You know, like I in in, in my like sobriety, like I'm in a, you know, spiritual program that I feel so grateful that I get to have like a collective experience of healing that's that's radical it's not safe um and so yeah a lot of my life looks like that emotional work one-on-one -on -one with other men um and i don't and i feel weird talking about it sometimes because i don't want it to be like self-congratulatory or anything like that but it's like it takes up a lot of space you know and um so those are i think some like really simple ways that i try to like understand those things better and like how to be you know well, I would hazard to add a little bit to that uh, by saying, like, I think the process of of sobriety is is not just about you know quitting a substance. It, it's also about reckoning. And I think like what I see often through your artistic process process is reckoning in that way. Like, there's a parallel almost to the work that you do with men through that spiritual process and um, and how you make work and the overall tra trajectory of your work. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I guess that's kind of what I was trying to get at is like there's, you know, like the ability to work through failure and reckon with failure and the ability to make and like own your mistakes, I think is it's it's a very unique thing. And I find that what I encounter a lot within the art world is a giant fear of failure, but also a very big fear of causing harm. Yeah. And and that that leads to paralysis, mm -hmm. like a racialized paralysis, particularly. I think it is a, a a particularly white paralysis in which people are afraid of hurting the sentiments um or oppressing others but within that like there that leads to a non-doing and what i what i've been able to kind of see as i've spent more time with your work is an undoing it's not a non-doing you know yeah, like yeah. 
and I'm not saying like you're like undoing patriarchy or undoing racism. No. That's impossible. But like mm -hmm. there's some there's a personal process that you're building uh, in your engagement with with the people you're working with around that. Right. Because well, because I feel like it's like it's like the thing of like well, what like theory versus action, right? Like mm -hmm. I like to like just like read something and then to like understand is different than to like try to enact, you know, change or enact, enact stuff, you know? And I think, I don't know, I don't know, but, but yeah, it's like, it's, it's wild. Cause like I benefit from all that stuff too. You know what I mean? Like I, I benefit from that, um, that, that, that taking risks. And I, I feel like, um, like every, all the ways that I've, I don't know, it just things can feel very full like things feel very full i think for me lately and um yeah i don't know um i'm gonna end with there's a couple of questions in the chat um there's one around authorship and how um how is authorship addressed in your work and will your collaborators be acknowledged when the work is exhibited yeah, always. Yeah, yeah. Not I'll, just not just that. It's also that there's a sharing of any income. Yeah, yeah. It's always like uh, that was like a really big mistake I made at first with authorship because I was like, oh, like consent and then transparency and then profit sharing. But then, and I I think I, there was something that was like a show or like something where an image was being shown and like I was credited as the creator, like the sole creator of the thing. And so, yeah, I think the authorship is, it's, it's like collective. So it's like the, the work is always like by all of us. So this Jimmy and I have um, these billboards up for contact right now um, on DuPont. There's these two like massive billboards of him. And, you know, if you go on the contact website, it's like Jeff Burke and Jimmy James Evans. So yeah, it's important for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, we're almost out of time. Um, we've got one minute left and somebody is really excited about the way that you use light and wants to know everything about that. Um, and I'm wondering if that has to be saved for another conversation, but I'm wondering if you have any parting thoughts before we, before we wrap it up today. Oh, I'm just, I just want to thank you. And it was, it's really nice to talk. I feel like, I feel like we're just at the beginning of some some conversation right now. You know what I mean? <laughs> I feel like we're just like come to the beginning now. Um, but yeah, it's like I just appreciate you so much. Thank you so much. I want to thank you, Jeff, and I want to thank the AGO for having us. Um, I also feel like we're just at the beginning. I'm like, oh, okay, now we now we can start the conversation now that we like got the background out of the way. Yeah. Yeah. So much more to say always. Mm -hmm. I guess we'll leave it at that, right? Yeah. Thank, thank you so much, Jeff. It was such a pleasure, as always, to chat. Thank you. All right.